So I think we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Rachel Stoll. I'm the Managing Director here at the Stimson Center, and I direct the Center's Conventional Defense Program, which examines issues related to the responsibility, transparency, and accountability in the global trade in and use of conventional weapons. And we're going to be talking about the use of some of those uh, weapons here today. Uh, we'll be talking a lot this afternoon about the challenges that have um, resulted from the U.S. approach to airstrikes and counterterrorism operations around the world. And we'll spend some time focusing specifically on one case, which is Somalia. And I think um, I'll let Brian tell us why we're talking about Somalia. Uh, but we'll also be looking at uh, U.S. operations worldwide. So I want to thank everyone for joining us in the room today and for those who are watching our live streaming. We're going to um, hear from our speakers and then we'll open it up to Q&A because I often find in these kinds of events that's the most interesting part of the conversation. Um, and we're going to try something new, which is to take questions from the live stream. We've never done this before. I know, it's very exciting. Um, <laughs> so if you're going to ask a question on the live stream, then there's a place to, as you're watching, there's a place to comment. And we will moderate those, and they will be asked from someone in the audience. So hopefully this will all work. So bear with us and, and be patient, so, and we'll try and incorporate your questions as well as we can into our Q&A. So I really want to thank our truly fantastic panel of speakers uh, for joining us today to shed light on different aspects of this issue and address the concerns surrounding U.S. policies and practices in U.S. counterterrorism operations. I want to quickly introduce our speakers, then I'll allow them to make some short remarks. I'll then ask them a question and then, and then open it up to you. So starting here at my left, we have Missy Ryan from the Washington Post, who I'm sure all of you have read um, daily uh, in, in this town particularly. Uh, Missy has covered the Pentagon, military issues, and national security for the Washington Post since tw 2014. Previously, she was a foreign correspondent and Washington reporter for Reuters, including stints as acting bureau chief for Mexico and Central America and deputy bureau chief for Iraq. And she has reported, if you follow her work from Iraq, Egypt, Libya, Lebanon, Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, and Chile. And the reason I read that list was because many of those countries are countries where we're seeing some of the strikes that we're talking about today. Moving on to Missy's left, we have Sarah Holwinski, who's a professor of practice at Arizona State University and a senior fellow at, the New, at New America. Sarah was senior advisor to the Chairman's Action Group and the Transregional Threats Coordination Cell on the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the U.S. Department of Defense. She's also been a senior fellow with the Center for New American Security during that time. And previously, she served as um, Ambassador Samantha Powers, Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. Also, I think one of Sarah's, uh, it's a lot, but one of the other reasons that I think she's an asset to this panel is that she served for nearly a decade as executive director for the Center for Civilians in Conflict. Um, and for those of, who, of you who don't know who, um, but she led the organization's efforts to advise warring parties on civilian harm in Iraq, Afghanistan, Burma, Somalia, Libya, and other countries um, that we'll be discussing today as well. And finally, to my right, and who will be our first speaker, um, is Brian Kastner, who's with Amnesty International. He is uh, Amnesty's International Senior Crisis Advisor for Arms and Military Operations. That's a really good title. Uh, where he provides expertise in explosive ordnance and military affairs to um, investigate and prevent war crimes. Some of you may know um, Brian as a best-selling author of three nonfiction books. I know we have some fans in the audience. Um, oh, I know we do for sure. Uh, she, one of them might work for me. Uh, Disappointment River, All the Ways We Kill and Die, and The Long Walk. Um, Brian also served as an explosive ordnance disposal officer in the U.S. Air Force, so comes with also a military background to this. So before, those of you who know me know I'm not going to turn down an opportunity to make some of my own points as well. Uh, so I do want to make a few introductory remarks to put what we're talking about today in a context so that you can see the, the, ask, the value that, that our three speakers bring. First of all, you know, you plan events like this, and then things happen in the world, and you look like a genius. But in reality, um, this event is very timely, because earlier this month we saw 
the Trump administration issue an executive order that rescinded an, a, a section of an Obama era executive order that required the director of national intelligence to submit an annual public um, accounting of casualties resulting from U.S. counterterrorism strikes. We're going to talk about th that in detail, but that's only a few weeks old. So we still, we don't know, you know, the implications of that today, but it's certainly something that we want to talk about uh, for the future. And yesterday, a German court found that given serious doubts about the legality of many U.S. drone strikes in Yemen, as part of U.S. counterterrorism operations, Germany must now take action to ensure that the U.S. use of the air base at Ramstein, where many of these are operating from, is in accordance with international law. So I know we have some people watching um, from Europe, and we're hopeful to hear from them as to how that court decision also affects um, what other countries are doing and the kinds of operations that they are involved in. And I think the German case really highlights that both at home and abroad, there are questions, very serious questions, about the legality and the legitimacy of the U.S. drone program and lingering issues with transparency and accountability of U.S. actions around the world, even if they aren't undertaken um, by drones themselves. So in our work here at the Stimson Center, we've looked at how things have changed with regards to airstrikes under the Trump administration. We've seen a continued commitment to the use of air power in counterterrorism operations around the world uh, to include unmanned systems or drones. Uh, this approach was also favored by the Obama administration um, and has led to a considerable expansion in U.S. operations. But what we found in our research in the last two years um, in particular is that the ambiguity surrounding U.S. policy and the uncertainty about what the Trump administration is doing has contributed to these lingering questions and enduring questions about the legality, efficacy, and legitimacy of the U.S. drone program, which has a direct bearing on U.S. counterterrorism operations around the world. And indeed, the administra this administration's approach to air operations, particularly to um, in areas outside of what are referred to active area or areas of active hostilities or areas where the U.S. is not engaged in a traditional armed conflict has arguably been less defi defined by less transparency and less accountability. And this administration has undertaken several changes just in the first two years um, to U.S. policy and practice in this regard as compared to the Obama administration. I just want to highlight what those are because as we're talking, I want you to think about um, these in the back of your mind. First, we've seen an increasing tempo of airstrikes. We've expanded the geographic scope of operations in areas the U.S. government considers outside active hostilities. The U.S. has been delegating more strike decision authority away from the White House to military operators. They've lowered the decision-making thresholds that are required to take lethal action against terrorism suspects outside of war zones, and they have broadened the role of the CIA in conducting these lethal strikes. Moreover, the, US, or the Trump administration is widely believed to have revised the guiding document for U.S. direct action in areas where we are not at war, which, if you've come to previous Stimson events, we've spent a lot of time talking about what's been referred to as the PPG, is currently operating under new guidance, which is referred to as the PSP, Principal Standards and Procedures, which removes certain limitations and civilian uh, protections. The administration's approach and its ongoing actions in places such as Somalia, which we're going to discuss here in a moment, underscores the concerns that we've raised in particular in previous years about the precedent that the U.S. is sending around the world um, in terms of the decision-making process and how um, to operate in areas outside of traditional battlefields. I think at the end of the Obama administration, and certainly we had this uh, an event like this about two years ago at sort of the end of the Obama administration, they started to recognize um, some of these concerns and the risks that were being um, that were inherent in such an approach, and they took um, very concrete steps to put the program of targeted targeted strikes, including um, via drones, on firmer footing. But these recent actions by the Trump administration give me concern um, as we're seeing a rollback of measures um, and show some of the weaknesses of the Obama administration's approach in general. 
So with that, I want to turn over to our panelists who will share some of their insights. And I, I, um, I'm eager to hear Brian talk about the new amnesty report that was launched today about uh, US airstrikes in Somalia and the uh, resulting civilian casualties from those strikes. So yes. I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming today. You could have been doing something else. You could be out in the sunshine in the park and you come to talk about this and appreciate that. So today uh, we do have uh, a new report being launched on U.S. airstrikes in Somalia and the number of civilian casualties that were there. As you know, AFRICOM reported to Congress, uh, it would have been um, last summer in 2018, that they killed zero civilians in Somalia in 2017, and then, then they have repeated this, uh, that they have also killed uh, zero civilians in 2018 as well. And today, or yesterday, they issued a press release that uh, they've done 110 airstrikes in Somalia uh, basically since June of 2017. And in those 110 airstrikes, they have killed 800 terrorists, their word. And that in all of those 110, uh, that there was not a single civilian killed and that they are 800 for 800 in, uh, in terrorists killed. And I, I have to admit, if they had maybe reported another number uh, you know, back to Congress last year, something that seemed more realistic. Nothing is perfect in war. Airstrikes are not perfect. If they had reported a number that was not up just you know, on its face an issue, we might not have started this work. But uh, we did because I think our gut and most people's gut is that they're um, just in combat. That's not what happens. So we investigated uh, a number of those strikes. We spent time on about 15 of those 110 strikes out of those 15. Five of them reached an evidentiary threshold for us that we felt like we had a, uh, confidence in what was going on and we could corroborate. And in those five, we found 14 civilians killed and eight civilians injured in those, in those five. And all five of those were in the lower Shabeli region of Somalia, which is kind of the region right outside of Mogadishu. Uh, there are a lot of restrictions and a lot of challenges in working in Somalia. We could not get to the scene of any of these strikes. They're all in Al-Shabaab controlled territory. Uh, we had to invite people to come to Mogadishu that live in these villages and get them to Mogadishu to talk. Uh, sometimes it was like pulling teeth from a chicken to get people to come. Uh, they are scared of Al-Shabaab. It's a dangerous journey. Uh, they were not uh, coming to, in many, in, you know, in many cases, they were not coming uh, to spin a story that they had already created. They were, we had identified that a strike had happened in a certain place, and we sent out uh, fixers to try to, you know, to get into the area and bring some people back. And then we're able to corroborate that uh, with satellite imagery. In some cases, it's, you know, it's very obvious that uh, a strike happened for sure. We can corroborate it with some open source investigation, uh, geolocating the specific strikes. Um, side note, Smartphones are banned in Al-Shabaab controlled areas for civilians. So unlike Yemen and unlike Syria and some other places, there are very few photos, there's very little video. People are not tweeting out the results of this afterwards. We can't call them securely where they are. Um, and so the, uh, the number of photos that we had were, were very few, but in the few that we had, we were able in one specific case to be able to say we could geolocate it exactly to the exact grid of where this strike happened. Uh, and there was actually scrap from the weapon used. Uh, we talked to doctors who had treated some of these victims. Uh, and so that we were, that was a level of corroboration. In one case, it was uh, one of the civilians killed was a technician for the local mobile phone company for Hormud Telecommunications. We could confirm that he died with the telecommunications company. Um, and so, so this, is, this is our basic finding. Uh, we, have, we have worked with AFRICOM uh, kind of over the months. We have, we've engaged with them in Stuttgart. We've met with them. We, have, um, we sent them a formal list of questions, actually um, a long formal list of questions. They answered some. They did not answer uh, others of those. They responded to each strike. We, uh, we included their response in our report you know, for you to read to see what their uh, what their response was. The five strikes kind of fall into two basic categories. And I should say up front that AFRICOM has admitted to four of them, and one of them they said it wasn't them. Uh, but in the four where they admitted to it, and we say, you know, uh, 
so many people die, they say that, you know, that that's incorrect, that, that no civilians were killed. So the two basic models, and this will be the kind of the two buckets we can put the strikes in that produce civilian casualties will not be a surprise to people that have studied this issue. This issue. In the first category, it's where uh, an Al-Shabaab vehicle is driving down the road. Everybody knows it's Al-Shabaab. Um, uh, it's, it's in Al-Shabaab controlled territory. They, uh, the AFRICOM hits the vehicle, but then they happen to kill civilians that are nearby, maybe in the village as it's, as it's driving through uh, the village there. And the second main category we would call uh, just cases of misidentification, where uh, AFRICOM says that they're Al-Shabaab fighters and their families tell us that they are civilians, but then more importantly, the corroborating information says that they're civilians as well, uh, and so we would categorize them that way. So those are the two main um, buckets. So I'm just gonna, uh, uh, let me talk about two other things briefly um, so we can get to the other panelists. The first is uh, kind of a broader policy issue. Um, so when AFRICOM disagrees with us, there is the one case where we say it's likely they did it, and they say they did not do it. So putting that one aside, for the four that, that they admit to, uh, how, how do we explain this? Well, in, in some of the cases, we disagree basically on the facts. We say uh, a few Al-Shabaab died in this vehicle. We say some civilians nearby were died and injured. And AFRICOM says, well, we just, that, that's just not correct. Our information is that, say, three people were injured, is in one of the strikes in Farawais. In that, in that case, it's, uh, it's a question of, you know, we're just trying to figure out the facts there. In most of the other cases, though, honestly, it's that we agree on the strike location, we agree on the weapon used, we agreed on maybe mostly what the Al-Shabaab target is, uh, and we disagree whether the people killed were Al-Shabaab or whether they were civilians. And the trend that we have, we have found both from interviewing former military officials and this will sound similar to, say, Afghanistan in 2012, is that if you are a military-age male and you are living in an Al-Shabaab-controlled area and you are seen with known Al-Shabaab, that you are then categorized in part of, uh, AFRICOM will call it Al-Shabaab affiliates or the Al-Shabaab network, people that are thought to be supporting Al-Shabaab and people that the U.S. is calling a combatant and Amnesty International would call a civilian and not, uh, and not a legitimate target. And the example, maybe the best example, is that one I gave you of the Hormuz telecommunications um, uh, one where there was a strike on an Al-Shabaab vehicle near a little village called Gobale in August of last year. Uh, Al-Shabaab controlled area, everybody agrees to that. There's a vehicle going down the road. There was an Al-Shabaab member in the vehicle. Um, you know, that's what our tes testimony tells us as well. But the three other... Uh, men in the vehicle, two of them were well diggers uh, going to work on a borehole to, to dig a well, and the, the last guy was this Hormuz uh, technician. And so that AFRICOM press release says four terrorists, and if Amnesty, when we write that up, we write that up as one Al-Shabaab member and, um, and three civilians. And so this categorization issue and the policy, um, Rachel was just talking about areas outside of active hostilities. Uh, our concern is the opposite. In March of 2017, when there was a presidential directive declaring Somalia to be an area of active hostilities, the way General Bulldog has described what happens is it opens the aperture to be able to hit additional targets and additional people, and that includes the network and the affiliates. And so who is this network and who are the affiliates um, and are those lawful targets or not is, is our concern. Last point I would make on some of our recommendations um, obviously, we're asking AFRICOM and the U.S. government to investigate all these, uh, not only our strikes, but other strikes where there might be civilian casualty allegations. But the other one really is to get, uh, to have a mechanism for a local average Somali to be able to report to the U.S. government that their cousin died. There's been a lot of talk about this lately, I know, uh, and on the Hill as well, about having some sort of reporting mechanism. Uh, there's talk of an online mechanism where you can, and this might work in Yemen or it might work in Syria, but remember I said smartphones are banned in areas, uh, in Al-Shabaab areas, so they don't have the internet. And if this person who loses a cousin manages to get on a bus and get to Mogadishu and actually wants to go and tell someone what happened, there are literally three levels of walls and armed guards between them 
and the U.S. mission on the grounds of the Mogadishu Airport. There is not a way, that person's not going to be let in. There is not a way, there's not a front door for that person to knock, uh, that person to knock on and be able to say what happened. So that's um, also one of our recommendations as well. I've gone over my time, but that, that's an introduction no, to what we, what we launched today. Thanks, Brian. I mean, I, it's, you might have gone over your time. I, I, got, I was so sort of taken by what you were saying and sort of the tragedy of what we're seeing um, that, you know, very little of that information is shared not only with the American public but the world public given the constraints that you mentioned, but also that that is an area which has often been underreported in general in terms of, of our actions there. And reporting is a nice segue, uh, to, <laughs> unintentional actually, uh, to, to, to bring us to Missy Ryan who can talk a little bit about what she has seen firsthand in the Pentagon covering these issues um, through both the Obama administration and the Trump administration. Sure. No, I'm just going to... This is on now, I think. Uh, I'd like just to take a couple of minutes and give some uh, perspective uh, from the outside as someone who's been trying to track these issues for, um, for the audience that we write for. Um, and I've been doing that, that for about almost a decade now from when I worked in Iraq and then covering the Pentagon here in Washington. And I think the starting point um, that, that um, for the conversation um, uh, building uh, to discuss this interesting report about Somalia, I think is the fact that despite the fact that the United States has been conducting counterterrorism uh, air operations since 2001, there is still not a, a standardized, consistent way across the military, across combatant commands, so geographic areas, across named operations, and across time to deal with the issue of civilian casualties when it comes to um, how they are um, prevented on, um, in, an, in an individual operation, um, how they are dealt with when there are allegations of civilian casualties, and then how they are addressed when there are civilian casualties that are confirmed. And obviously there have been, um, it's been an issue that has really um, only at certain times since 9-11 really um, bubbled up into, um, I think, the, the public's view in terms of what most Americans are aware of, even though there have been a, there's been a regular drumbeat of allegations since 9-11. There's just a couple of moments that I'd like to, to point out over that um, course of time. Um, there was a feeling that um, the way that this issue was handled actually did improve a lot during um, a certain period in the war in Afghanistan. And that was, you know, around 2009, 2010, there was a feeling that among the senior military officers that um, the perception of repeated American strikes on civilian targets, families, weddings, whatever, in Afghanistan was actually becoming counterproductive to the counterinsurgency fight that the, US, that the United States was trying to wage in Afghanistan. And so the, the then commander, John McChrystal, you know, introduced new um, uh, rules for how um, uh, the commanders in the ground needed to deal with this. And really there just was um, an, an emphasis placed on the issue of avoiding the civilian casualties. And a lot of that came as well from the Afghan government that was um, elevating the profile of this issue. And so that was one moment of time. And then you fast forward um, almost a decade later, um, or let's say step back a little bit at the end of the Obama administration in response to some of the issues that you're talking about related to drone strikes. The Obama administration rolled out an executive order regarding civilian casualties and that tried to have some sort of more stringent um, requirements related to, um, among other things, reporting to the public about what was happening. And not only was there, um, was that driven by um, a sort of a principle related to transparency, but also a feeling that if um, people are aware of what the outcome, what the real outcome of the strikes are, maybe this will create a virtuous cycle um, that will avoid them in the future. Um, uh, in, when uh, President Trump was elected, as Rachel mentioned, there was a loosening of certain rules related to air operations that some people think has led to an increase in strikes. Whether that's true is very much a point of contention within the military, and Sarah, I'm sure, could talk to that in greater detail. Um, but one, uh, another moment that I think is really important to this conversation is um, the operations, the air operations to liberate Mosul and Raqqa in um, 2017. Um, and uh, 
what happened at that moment was just because of the nature of these conflicts, there were very intense uh, urban battles, and you had you know, Islamic State militants who were in these, you know, Mosul is a city of a couple of million people at the, at the, at the um, minimum, and you have people packed in alongside militants. Militants are using families as human shields, and it just posed a real challenge for um, the American air operators. And so you had a spate of very high profile um, civilian casualty allegations, including one incident in uh, March of 2017 in which um, there were at least 100 people who were killed, who were confirmed, later confirmed to be killed in one American airstrike. And I think that that, um, number one, attracted a whole lot of media attention. Um, it um, uh, triggered outcry from advocates, from watchdog groups, and it really caused this moment of self-examination and self-scrutiny um, at the leadership of the Pentagon. And that kicked off a process um, that um, Sarah knows a lot about, and um, I've written about some, which was you know, some internal review and study within the Pentagon to say, you know, do we need to come up with a new system for doing this? Um, and the Pentagon is now in the midst of a lengthy process to come up with its first ever military-wide policy for dealing with civilian casualties. And um, I think there, that is a, a pretty big deal in and of itself, um, the fact that there's this bureaucratic lift and attention, high-level attention in the military to this issue. Um, because you know, often the victims, they're not Americans, they often can't speak up, um, and they're not you know, constituents um, for Congress. Um, and so the fact that there is this high-level attention being placed on that issue I think is very significant. Um, that said, I think there are some reasons to be skeptical about what the review process will accomplish, um, just because there are a lot of sort of built-in bureaucratic antibodies to um, operational changes at the very least and to potentially even additional transparency um, at a moment um, when um, the Trump administration has sort of reduced transparency about military operations across the board. Um, and so, you know, we're at a moment where uh, the air operations against the Islamic State are really winding down um, as the, the campaign in Iraq and Syria is coming to a conclusion. Um, there is a, a spike in operations in places like Somalia, um, a steady pace in, of periodic airstrikes in Yemen, and I think it really remains to be seen whether or not this issue will maintain the, the sort of public attention um, that forced the P Pentagon to even raise the possibility of significant change that could protect civilians in the future. Th thanks, Missy. I mean, I read, I saw some tweet today, so it could be completely inaccurate. But it was something like, since 1991, the U.S. has conducted airstrikes every single year in Iraq. Like, there hasn't been a year where the U.S. hasn't been operating in that location. And so this, while we're winding down, I mean, it is, it is cyclical, right? We are seeing places where um, you have ramping up in, in one case and then sort of a, a lessening in another, but it certainly is something that um, it's not going to be, even if we wind down operations in certain areas, these questions regarding civilians and accountability about strikes. I mean, I think Brian started by saying, you know, in war, mistakes happen. Things, things go wrong, not because people are malintended necessarily, but because that's the nature of conflict. Um, Sarah, you've spent a long time looking at these issues of when civilians are harmed in conflict and how um, that has been addressed, how that is dealt with. You've come, you've sort of been outside and inside, so I'm, I'm curious as to your perspectives uh, uh, regarding this executive order, um, the rescinding of this one section, and what that means for sort of the future of, of protection of civilians and, and where we sort of go from here. Sure. So, as you noted, I've been working on this for an extraordinarily long time. So let me start with this. I'm just going to break down the professional wall and say I have been working on civilian casualties for 15 years. And what sounds different about this conversation? Absolutely nothing. So 2005, 2006, 2003, 2009, we had a little bit of an improvement. You know what died? Counterinsurgency. Then we went to counterterrorism, and we had civilian casualties all over again. And everyone is like, oh, we, well, how do we investigate? Or how do we, and, and 
I mean, the thing is, so you, you um, mentioned that there should be a reporting mechanism. You know what we recommended in 2006? A public reporting mechanism. And what the State Department created in 2014? A public reporting mechanism um, that really didn't go anywhere. The woman who um, founded Center for Civilians in Conflict, Marla Rizika, who was killed in Iraq, before that, um, she would go to the embassies, to the US embassies and to the Afghan and Iraqi governments and stand outside with war victims and hold up signs that said, this woman lost three children. What are you gonna do about it? That was the only way to get the information across and thankfully the media covered it. But you know, this is just, it's Groundhog Day every day. Um, and it is, and it's the civilians who are losing their lives, losing their limbs, losing their homes. Um, what I'd like to say is that, so I was in the Joint Staff for, for two years working on these issues and they have a really dedicated, wonderful group of people who really care about civilian casualties doing the right thing, addressing these issues. Nearly every military officer who, who wasn't even working on these issues that I spoke to could name the four or five reasons why we would want to prevent and address civilian casualties. And they were eloquent about it, they totally got it. So what's the problem? Why are we back in this he, shed, he said, she said, Amnesty said, AFRICOM said? Um, and I think that there are several reasons for that. Um, one, actually, I'm just going to fold all of this into one. So there's one big reason for that. <laughs> civilian, the civilian population is not taken into account in strategy, operational planning, or sometimes tactics. So the three levels of what the US military is doing. Now you will, so, so on paper, whatever is on paper is what matters to the military. That's what they implement. So you've got a strategy, then you have your con ops, your concept of operations, you've got your operational plans, and you've got your tactics to carry it out. In all of those things, the military will tell you, and it is absolutely true, we take seriously civilian protection, we abide by LOAC, the Laws of Armed Conflict, or International Humanitarian Law. We want to cause zero collateral damage. That's not enough. It needs to be in the strategy. It needs to be an objective of the operational plan to not cause civilian harm, or if you wanna go even further, to protect civilians. So think about Mosul. The US, their objective, their mission, was to rid the city of ISIS. The Iraqi forces, their objective was to liberate the people. Those two things are gonna look extraordinarily different when you put them on paper, no matter how much they sound the same when you're speaking it. So the other thing that is really important in addition to having the text is thinking about who's in the room. So what I learned being on the joint staff is that you know, we, I was in conversations about strategy and operational plans and campaigns. I was the only person in the room with any non-military expertise about the civilian population. So when those things were being planned, I could say, hey, what about the civilian population? Even just that big, broad question that is not to say that the people in the room, that all of the officers in the room didn't care about the civilian population, but that is not what their perspective is. That is not where their history is. That's not where they come from or what their background is in. So having somebody with expertise in civilian protection in the room is extraordinarily important. As far as I know, it's a big building, as far as I know, there is currently nobody with that expertise working in the Department of Defense. That's a real problem. I don't know about the COCOMs, possibly. And there, have, there are certainly enough military who've been working on it for long enough to have civilian protection expertise, but they're still coming from that military perspective. Then you think about the National Defense Strategy. 
We're going to peer-to-peer -peer conflict. That's what we're readying for. So you know how we lost civilian protection when we went from COIN to counterterrorism, from counterinsurgency to counterterrorism? Every military person I talk to about peer-to-peer -peer conflict says all of this progress, whatever progress you can say about civilian casualties, is gone when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer conflict, if we're going up against Russia or China and some sort of existential threat. So these are these big issues and how to fit civilian protection, it's like, it's like mainlining. No, that's heroin. Mainstreaming. <laughs> it's like mainstreaming <laughs> civilian protection into how the military goes about its daily business. We might need to mainline. <laughs> we might need to mainline. Civilian protection. <laughs> Only civilian protection. Those things are so much harder to wrap your head around if you're a desk officer and how to fix that than fighting with amnesty over whether it was 14 or 11 or none and doing an investigation. Um, you asked about Section 3. Do we still have time? Yes. No, okay. No, no, I think it's Executive order. It's a really, it's a beautiful document. Take a look at it. Um, it was created under President Obama. It's basically a series of best practices that the U.S. military uses for civilian casualties, uh, both preventing and addressing them. Section 3 required reporting on all civilian casualties. Now, that was followed up with the National Defense Authorization Act, which required reporting on DOD-caused civilian casualties. <laughs> A little bit of a difference here. So when the White House says that it's redundant reporting, that's correct in some ways. But what you're now missing that is going to Congress or the public are other agencies who are also conducting operations, which is the CIA. And also what was never in, I think, any of these reporting requirements was um, US military partnered with other forces who then cause civilian casualties. And we may be giving them intelligence, surveillance, weapons, wh advising, whatever it is. That wasn't in there at all. So what are the fixes to get this transparency back? I think Congress is looking at legislating, um, getting numbers from all US operations, counterterrorism operations. Um, you could also look at Section 4 of the executive order, which has never been implemented, and that says you've got to track over time and analyze what's happening because 14 civilian casualties compared to what? Zero last month? 200 last month? That tells you quite a lot about your operations and what's actually happening. And we've never done that. So we, don't, we can't even see this. You know, there's some Excel spreadsheets out there. That's not going to tell you what you need to know. And I guess my, oh, I would say that the executive order in Section 3, that's a really big deal compared to other nations. Other nations don't have anything like this. When it comes to what kind of transparency Americans actually need, it is minuscule. It is just the beginning of trying to wrap your hands around what these conflicts and what these operations mean to civilian populations and to our fight against terror. And my last point would just be in a, on a deeply cynical note, because I know that that's a good way to end <laughs> remarks, <laughs> is to say, if we have increased transparency, will the American public actually care? Well, that's a depressing <laughs> thought, Sarah. But I, I think... I do think that, yes, it is minuscule, you know, the transparency that, and, and really, in some ways, the U.S. has more transparency than other, than other countries. And so the example that we set, the practice that we set, these best practices that are laid out in the executive order are important for other countries, which are now ramping up their own programs, whether they are drone programs or just the airstrikes in, in areas where it's very difficult to get information, but a standard of behavior that we would like to see uh, governments operate under, not just under the laws of armed conflict, but in terms of just what is good, is good practice and makes sense. I think, um, I think the, the difficulty that you mentioned in sort of tracking things over time and not having those metrics, we've talked about that a lot in this room with all of you about not understanding whether or not airstrikes are having the intended result. Are we just, you know, it sounds great. We've had 110 strikes in, in um, Somalia and we've killed 800 terrorists. I don't know if that's actually a good ratio, but because I don't know. 
But, you know, that sound, there's, that's something tangible, something you can grab onto that must have an impact. But is that impact actually advancing U.S. interest? Is that achieving the outcome um, that we, you know, that we are fighting for? And I guess the question I would have to you, I'm going to start with you, Sarah, is, you know, if you, you mentioned this shift, you know, we don't talk about coin anymore and how it's counterterrorism. If you could change sort of one thing about U.S. counterterrorism operations, what, maybe it's not one, but what would that be in terms of sort of understanding this big picture so that we're not just renaming something, reinventing the same problems that we've had and not figuring out how to um, advance sort of the cause that we're all seem to be on this stage at least committed to? So I'm going to say get the CIA out of military operations writ large. There is absolutely no reason, aside from intelligence gathering, which I think is in the name of the CIA, <laughs> aside from that, which they do very well, get them out of military operations. Otherwise, you're not going to have the transparency that you should have. I would also say, take a look at counterterrorism and what it's doing around the world. Should it even be a military operation? Or should we be doing law enforcement or something else? I don't know the last time that this has actually been, you know, let's take a look at what we're doing in the world and think about how we want to go about it. And how diplomacy has sort of taken a back seat to, I know, it's a, it's a crazy idea. Um, but diplomacy has really, I think, taken a back seat yes. to, you know, use of force or threat of use of force um, around the world. I guess my question then for Missy, just following on for that, is that's a, lot, that's a big change. You know, are we going to see change or are we sort of on a down? I have felt like in the last two years as we look at sort of U.S. policy in this realm, that we are taking many steps back. We're rolling things back. Are we, are we at the beginning of that roll downhill? I hope not. Um, or are, are things going to sort of smooth and, and, and take, a, take a sort of an upward trajectory? You know, is change possible? You know, I, I, I want to be optimistic. And, and I do think uh, it's, it is, as I said earlier, significant that people are at least um, talking about a systemic uh, some systemic changes, but at the risk of um, having a whole panel full of uh, cynic <laughs> downers, I, I'm not very optimistic that there is going to be um, any significant operational changes. Um, when you talk to the targeteers and the air operations folks, they will um, give you a very impressive um, uh, rundown on the array of strike measures that they take to surveil sites, to um, uh, avoid uh, hitting people who pop into the screens at the last minute, to um, oh, oh, me. Me, sorry, to identify um, who uh, who they're trying to get. Um, I use the right do the sort of uh, calculations regarding the the. Uh, projected blast radius of the particular weapon that they're going to use. The collateral damage estimate, and I've seen it, and I took calculus. There's no way I could <laughs> actually do it. It is so extensive. And all of that, you know, is intended to um, avoid civilian casualties for the obvious reasons that, you know, people would be talking to Sarah about, which is that everybody knows that it's counterproductive to kill civilians in a counterinsurgency campaign. Um, that said, you know, I have observed um, from my own vantage point this disconnect that Sarah described between um, those precautions, the intentions that are associated with them, and the outcome. And uh, I think that um, because I haven't seen, because the high level interest and the, you know, uh, former Secretary of Defense Mattis was a big driver of this. Um, I think the fact that he's gone is not particularly good for, for the prospects for all of this. But because even people like Mattis and um, General Dunford, as far as I know, are not pressing for operational changes or any tactical pre-strike changes, um, rather they're focusing on the post-strike changes, um, I'm not optimistic that there's going to be a big change in the, in the near term. So on that happy note, um, Brian, I want to I want to ask you. We talked a lot about. I mean, this has been very fascinating for me, and I have lots of questions actually with regards to your report um, and just in general about this issue. But I'm wondering. We spent a lot of time just saying airstrikes 
And I wonder if you can talk, if you, if you know in your investigations, do you know what kinds of weapons have been used? We used to get information where we could distinguish between this was an unmanned strike, this was a manned strike. We don't right. have that level of detail anymore. Were you able to discover what weapons were used and, and the, the kinds of strikes they were? In some cases, yes. And I'll answer that with a cynical... Do I, is my mic on? Okay, okay, good. I'll answer that with a cynical <laughs> response. Again, no to keep. <laughs> Actually, I'm a, can I address the uh, yeah, absolutely. last thing that Sarah said first? Because usually I'm the most cynical person on the panel, and I admire, <laughs> yes, I admire the level of cynicism, but I actually have, um, I have something positive to say, which is like surprising me. Um, would, would the American people uh, care and pay attention if, you know, if all of this stuff were implemented as we talked about? Um, I don't know. I think it would make a big difference to the people of Somalia. I think it would make a really big difference to the people of Syria and in Mosul. And it's uh, effectively what we're doing is we're gaslighting a country and we're telling them that uh, you know your daughter that died, she didn't die. Or your daughter that died was actually Al-Shabaab. And to actually be able to say, no, we screwed this up, we the US screwed this up, um, I don't know if American citizens will care. I think Somali citizens will care, and I think that that, that would make a difference. And we shouldn't lose. I think that's a really, we should not lose sight that it's not just about us. I know that's hard in this country and in this town in particular, um, but it isn't really just about us. Uh, okay, so now I've got a cynical answer yeah, on sure. the airstrike thing. <laughs> so speaking of lack of transparency and everything else, so what we were able to do because we had some photos uh, in some of these strikes. Um, Usually we've been using kind of the term drone strike as kind of this catch-all term for a, an airstrike in the middle of nowhere that kills people while they're sleeping and is unrelated to, um, you know, to maybe some other particular conflict or urban conflict in Mosul or whatever else. We've actually found in our report that some of the strikes were done by drones, but some of them were done by AC-130 gunships using brand new weapons like GVU-69, which is a small glide munition. It pops out of a tube. It doesn't have a rocket motor, so you can't hear it. It flies to the target. It can fly um, you know, at least a dozen miles or so. It's got a 36-pound warhead. You don't hear it come in. It can come over the horizon. And this, I mean, an AC-130, as many people know, like that's used to support infantry on the ground. It's a, um, or it's used in counterterrorism raids. It is, you know, it's got a howitzer, a 105 millimeter artillery piece out the side. And this isn't being used in that kind of like traditional combat role. It's now being used in the, I don't know, I call it the secret airstrike role, uh, where it's flying either from Djibouti or uh, potentially Kuwait or Al-Assad in Iraq. We've seen that they're based kind of in various places. Um, and because there's not a threat, there's not an air threat, a surface to air missile threat, you know, the AC-130 is able to fly in and, and do these kind of attacks in places where we would normally say uh, the drones are doing it. So why is this happening? Uh, I don't want to speculate too much. I would say that the first GBU-69 that we saw uh, was in November of 2017, which is just after the main fight in Mosul and Raqqa had finished up. And maybe as these assets are becoming available and are not needed to fight ISIS, now they're being used in other theaters. And, you know, so this is at Amnesty where, um, I don't know, this is a kind of like a policy thing, a national security thing we don't always necessarily get into. Um, but it is news, you know, mm -hmm, that, these, mm -hmm. that these weapons and, and these gunships are being used in Somalia, I think. We weren't able to find open source reporting on it until we found the weapons and, you know, had to explain why they were there. Great, thank you. Well, I want to open up, we have about 35 minutes. I want to open it up to questions. Um, so I'm going to start with this woman in the back. There's a microphone that we'd like you to use so the people on the live stream who, don't forget, people on the live stream, you can type in your question. Hopefully it's working, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and we'll get to those as well. I think one of the things that lacks in some of the reports, um, even though they talk about the civilian deaths, they forget the impact of the community as a whole. Um, one person can be killed, but that person could be the breadwinner. That person will be the reason why that family becomes displaced in that community. Mm -hmm. So the rate of refugees from those places where they are striking goes up. 
and the rate of poverty also goes up. They cannot farm because they are always living in constant fear. So the Americans may not care, but the Somalians will care. We work in Somalia and they are impacted. They are crying, they are saying, we can't even live in our homes peacefully because all the time anything will happen. And how do you tell an al-Shabaab and an al-Shabaab? They are family members. So when you strike, you strike a family. When you strike, you strike a community. So they, they are very, very rare occasions where you can find them in their camps and strike them together. But most of the times they are within families, they are within communities, they are where they work, and they will definitely be with other people who have nothing to do with Al-Shabaab. So we should stop these lies of, you know, the number of civilians is 14 or 800 uh, Al-Shabaab. I think that's all lies. I come from Kenya and we know now that Al-Shabaab are integrated into our communities. It's it's hard to tell who is Al-Shabaab and who is not. So do you kill the whole community in order to achieve uh, your success uh, in the counterterrorism? And the other fact is, how much is this driven by the military complex? Because somebody somewhere is making money. And that's why they keep on using the new technology. You know, they keep on sending these drones so that they can make money. So why are we not as outraged about that as we should be? Thank you. Yes, yeah, sir. Can I just, I just want to clarify about the American people because I do think it's really important mm -hmm. that they care because the U.S. military, our policymakers and the U.S. military are supposed to be out there acting on behalf of the American people. And if the American people don't care that an entire community is being devastated or displaced, that's a real problem. And this comes to why we elect our leaders and why we have perhaps our current leader and, and, and how US engagement in warfare could change if the American public knew and cared about what we were doing in the world. Did you please make uh, I'd like to make a comment. I think that the issue that you brought up of um, how do, how, who, is, who is the target of any given strike um, touches on another important issue, which is what are the sources of information that the US military uses to conduct its post-strike assessment to determine, in effect, who died in this um, in this attack and, you know, was it a member of al-Shabaab, was it a civilian? And one of the things that we've seen, particularly in the Islamic State, the Operation Inherent Resolve oper uh, campaign has been that slowly um, U.S. Central Command has been opening its aperture ever so slightly to incor incorporate new forms of information, including social media, accounts from watchdog groups like Air Wars. And I think it, that is a very positive sign and they've got a long way to go. Um, but frankly, I don't, I, as you, AFRICOM said yesterday that it does the same. I haven't seen evidence of that so far, but I think that it behooves everyone to um, continue to apply pressure on the military to um, really open um, its uh, analytical door, so to speak, to all sources, sources of information because the traditional intelligence streams just don't cut it. We have a question from the live stream. I'm very excited. <laughs> can we bring the Can we bring the mic up here, Shannon? Thanks. So we're gonna read it out. This is so exciting. <laughs> it worked. It worked. 2019. I know. Okay. It's little the little thing. So this comes from Air Wars, and they oh. said, <laughs> Af "Hello, Chris Wood. We're not aware of Africom admitting any civilian fatal fatality from hundreds of strikes in North and East Africa in the past decade. In sharp contrast with CENTCOM." how to ensure best practice among U.S. commands. Thank you for your question. Yeah, so, uh, yes. U.S. policy and practice on civilian casualties has been ad hoc forever. Um, the new initiative that is being undertaken that Missy talked about is a Department of Defense instruction, and that basically means the Department of Defense for the first time in its history, will have a policy on civilian casualties. And that, um, we are hoping, will cover everything from prevention to investigations to how to 
track civilian casualties and how to um, respond to Somali civilians and Syrian civilians when that happens. So these things take a long time. I think 18 months to two years is probably what we're looking at, but um, this, is, this is the process and I think it's a good one. And just, but just a, uh, another uh, note of, of uh, caution is that you know, if, if the, goal, the goal of this process is to standardize how this is done across combatant commands, but even when it, within US Central Command, it deals with um, uh, addressing civilian casualty allegations dramatically differently between the different countries in which it operates. So there's one system for Operation Inherent Resolve, and there's a totally different system for Afghanistan and for Yemen and other places. Which makes sense, right? I mean, and so it, some of it is, um, you know, why doesn't AFRICOM admit things? I think there is a, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a political sensitivity where AFRICOM, obviously it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't have its base in the region. It's got it in Stuttgart for a reason. It doesn't want to be seen as in a war. One of the questions we asked AFRICOM, they don't answer is, is the U.S. at war in Somalia? Uh, Honestly, that's not like a gotcha question. It's like, what, what, <laughs> what is going on? Right. Is this, like, you declared it an area of active hostilities, and you're using international humanitarian law, which is the law of war, to apply to this situation. Are you at war if you're using the law of war, and you refer us to your law of war manual about, like, what's going on there? So it's not supposed to be gotcha, but I think there is, um, you know, country by country and command by command, there's all these sensitivities about, well, we can admit it. It's okay to admit it over here, but it's not okay to admit it over there. And what will people think about our, is, you know, is it okay in Libya, but it's not okay in Somalia and everything else. And so, yeah, it takes some time to go But through. they're also not talking to each other. I mean, the right. people who are doing Yemen are very siloed from the people who are doing Somalia. And right. so they're not sharing, like, hey, how should we address civilian casualties together? This gentleman in the back, his hand up. Hi, uh, Wes Morgan with Politico. Um, thank you guys very much for doing this. Um, it often seems in s some of these air campaigns, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq, Syria, that there's kind of two layers of air campaign going on in the same place, like a little mini JSOC air war um, of targeted killings that's embedded within the broader air war that the combatant command is doing. Uh, I'm wondering if you can speak to, did you find that to be the case in Somalia? and? If so, did you, do you think that AFRICOM kind of fully understands what's being done on its, by, on its behalf by its associated special operations task force? I mean, are they kind of on the same page as far as understanding the realities of what's happening in Somalia, what it means to be Shabab, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so that's a good question. And um, uh, if they don't answer if they're at war or not, like detailed questions about like what <laughs> under, uh, operation, like various things we're under. Um, and of course, I mean, we know from your reporting, of course, that there's some there's some stuff that is um, there are some strikes that are reported as in defense of U.S. forces because U.S. forces are advising Somali forces and they come under attack, and so there you know there's a retaliation or protect U.S. forces, and there are some that are planned, and or appear to be planned because they're not under that rubric in the press release, and I guess I could draw a conclusion that one is under, one is done for one and one is the other, uh, but it's not like AFRICOM ever says the word JSOC to us or says, you know, it uh, doesn't tell us the names of the operations for various things of what they're doing. It's all, um, and honestly, also don't tell us what, uh, what operations they are responsible for talking about and what operations they're not, and not just like CIA strikes that might be happening in Somalia, if those even exist and if those are happening, but do they fully report on JSOC ops? Are there other, is there another agency within the U.S. military that's doing stuff that they don't report? I don't know. So the four, you said they acknowledge the four of the five. The fifth one. The fifth one, they say it, uh, it's not, basically it's not us and we don't know what you're talking about. Now, not us, AFRICOM, or not us, the U.S. The U.S. No, they only speak for the for AFRICOM, so not us, AFRICOM. And I should say that in the report, one of the things we have in, um, we were able to do is we were able to find an anonymous source that was able to confirm to us that specific weapons were used by the U.S. Air Force, Air Force specifically, uh, on certain days in Somalia specifically. So we could it was like another corroboration um, of what was used and what the strike was. And in this case, uh, our source said, no, actually, the U.S. Air Force did not use a weapon on that day. 
okay, well, um, as we, we just learned, the Army has a Gray Eagle program. Would that be under AFRICOM? You know, could it have been uh, the Navy or the Marine Corps? Could it have been the CIA? Could it have been, could it have been, could it have been, you know, this is, this is where you end up. So even if the CIA were using an Air Force asset, that day it wouldn't have shown up on the Air Force. Maybe that's too much of a question, but that's I interesting to me, because I've heard that, but yeah. It's interesting to me too, and I, I mean, a lot of these questions are we don't know, and mm -hmm. then you start speculating on what it could be based mm -hmm. upon this little thread and that little thread. Let's start gentleman in the back, and then I'll move forward here. Hi, Dan Katz, Wilson Center. Regarding the civilians' population not being taken into account with the strategic, tactical, and operational planning, does that come down to an imbalance between the civilian and military within the Department of Defense, kind of similar to how we're seeing so many civilian positions kind of being left open and with the military dominating? And then also, when it comes down to these airstrikes, are we finding that, are they just increasing the um, frustration with the U.S. and with the West when we're not really taking care to prevent civilian casualties, or are we actually effectively degrading the capabilities and assets of groups like Shabab and furthering our goals of actually defeating them? Do you want to start with that, Sarah? So the policy process for coming up with a strategy like the Defeat ISIS campaign is, is such a complicated web of inputs that, that there's, really, there's no way to even start explaining it if I even know what I'm talking about. But in terms of how to implement that strategy in military terms, that is the military's purview. And so it is not up to you know, the civilians under the Secretary of Defense to get involved in you know, how we are specifically going to carry out this operation. And so who you've got in the room are men and women who have deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan 12 times. Um, they know this issue, but again, their job is not, they have not been trained to consider how to put the civilian population into that plan, which is where it needs to be. And I would just add that um, if you ask, I think most policymakers and senior military officials in the ISIS campaign, they would say we are doing this whole thing, at least partly on behalf of the civilians who are exploited by ISIS. So the faster that we defeat ISIS, the faster we'll be delivering the civilians from this horrible situation that they're in. And unfortunately, I think that, that at, at times there was um, perhaps some blurring of the potential for, or a failure to um, account fully for the potential that um, that idea would sometimes lead to a loosening of standards when it came to how you conduct a very, very challenging urban air campaign. Well, this gentleman here, and then we have another question on the live stream. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Nia Kwete. I am um, an immigrant from, of course, a single country in Africa, but I've lived in Washington for decades, and I lobby on all the Africa issues. Um, thanks for doing this. There are so many wonderful aspects, but the one that really caught my attention was the professor said she was ending on a cynical note that the American people are unlikely to care. And then Amnesty actually said the Somalis would care. And then of course my sister and fellow activists pointed out that it's important to the Somalis. And I had wanted to say it is important to all the Africans. But what I want to suggest, my, my contribution is a comment, and of course you are welcome to comment on my comment. <laughs> okay. but, um, I, I, I want to suggest that even though I wasn't born here, I have faith that if you talk the proper language to the American people, they will care. I, I know of no country whose general public, I think, cares more about public policy than the American general public. Maybe I'm biased because I worked in the anti-apartheid movement, 
and, and we overwhelmed Reagan when he was defending apartheid because the American people marched. So my appeal is that I'm sure there are a lot of um, activists and activist organizations here. If you, if you do the, it is hard, but if you do the hard work and point out to the American people what is being done in their name and how it shifts their image even as individuals traveling, they will care about what their government is doing. And I also think there is a role for the, for the uh, media in how they present these issues. That this is, this is a democracy. If the Chinese are killing people in Africa, you don't hold a China person responsible because they don't have a democratic government. Their leaders are not elected. Your leaders are elected and I'm saying it can work because I saw it work in 1986 when the whole Congress abandoned Mr. Reagan, who was very popular. So I think it can be done. Um, tell me that I'm wrong. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> you want, Sarah, Sarah. I'll just say, God bless the immigrants who can see the country more clearly than I can. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Um, I, I'll take this question then, since the mic's already back there, and then I'll move back up to the front for a second. Hi, Shannon Green from Center for Civilians and Conflict. So I wanted to pick up the thread on U.S. partners because I do think it's a really important dimension of this issue. So Sarah, you mentioned that there's not just an obligation to be transparent and accountable when it comes to U.S. airstrikes, but also to be transparent and accountable about when partners are responsible for civilian casualties when the U.S. military was providing some form of assistance. So I wanted um, any of you really to reflect on whether you see movement, particularly within the U.S. government or DOD, acknowledging that responsibility, but also the fact that because DOD does provide so much training and other forms of assistance, that perhaps they could be helping to transfer some of the lessons and best practices that have been learned to our partners. Thanks, Shannon. I would just say, you know, I think that there, it depends on the place and the circumstances. I think that, you know, in situations where the United States is um, coaching, like in Afghanistan, when the United States is coaching this nascent Air Force um, and providing intelligence, you know, I think there's some level of ownership. I think we're seeing a real turning point in Afghanistan on that, on that front right now because the Afghans are now conducting more and more strikes on their own. Um, uh, I don't know a ton about this, this topic, but I think there's been um, uh, some really worrying results in recent months on that. Um, and, um, but generally, I don't think that the culture of, um, of uh, the Pentagon is to own um, any sort of, have any sort of moral ownership towards strikes that other forces conduct. And I mean, obviously, Yemen would be um, a great place to talk about that right now. You know, the United States is not providing a lot of assistance, um, hands-on targeting assistance to the Saudis, but a lot of people think that we have moral ownership over what uh, the Saudis and the other Gulf countries are doing in Yemen, and you've seen very, very strong, consistent pushback from the Pentagon to that idea. And you're seeing strong pushback from Congress about, and for the, you know, really for the first time in, a, in 30 years, you're seeing Congress take an active role in trying to stop U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia for their use in Yemen due to the concerns um, that have been raised regarding civilian casualties. Sarah, did you have something on that before I? Okay. All right, I'm going to go back to the live stream. It's a success. <laughs> it works. Okay, this is from Anna Lamartum. Apologies if I mispronounced your name. For Brian specifically. So in relation to issues of target identification, you mentioned that target's relatives tell you they were not Al-Shabaab and that you collected corroborating evidence to confirm this. Can you explain what kind of evidence considering that you don't have access to these areas? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question because in a perfect world and actually most of what Amnesty does, um, I would want to go to the site, I want to go to the airstrike, place I'd want to go in the crater and dig out the dirt and pull the frag out myself and then like say there's the you know there's a house that overlooks this and okay I want to talk to the people in that house um, and you know to be able to um, 
you know, to really find out what happened. It's much more challenging in this case. So, so two things. One is uh, we don't talk to people and take their word for it. We, uh, we have what we call multiple entry points into the population. So we, you know, we're able to find, say, a witness or a family member. We talk to them. We maybe get from them other names of other people that we can talk to. We build a little picture from that. And then we start all over again from scratch and use a different fixer and a different source and then say, okay, now we'd like to be able to you know, talk to somebody that isn't associated with those first people uh, and then be able, to get that, um, be able to get that perspective. And then when you're able to say, okay, now we think these people were injured, we've talked to them ourselves, uh, we're able to talk to the doctor that treated them in one particular case um, uh, in a little uh, village called Fairweiss. That strike happened just a couple days after the major truck bombing in Mogadishu. The most deadly truck bomb in history was in Mogadishu in October 2017. Um, and they were shipping a lot of patients to uh, Sudan because they didn't have enough hospital beds. The doctor remembers shipping these particular you know, victims as well. And so uh, you know, you're able to corroborate that. And then sometimes, you know, sometimes it's that uh, when you talk to enough different people and it's not just that they say, well, my family member wasn't Al-Shabaab. They'll say, yes, yeah, Al-Shabaab's in our, in our village. And those are the Al-Shabaab guys. And we know where they are, and we know who they are. Um, and yeah, my cousin is Al-Shabaab, but, my, but, you know, but you know, this cousin isn't. And people are actually, I, I mean, they're willing, very few of them say, oh, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Every, like, nothing's going, nothing to see here is just completely innocent. And then when, um, just to use one more example quickly, um, there's a case called in Dar es Salaam, which was November 2017, where these three men died um, in a field. They were sleeping. It was 2.30 in the morning. They were out there as farmers. Uh, we have a question. Why, why are there farmers out at 2.30 in the morning? And, and does this make sense? And isn't that suspicious? And shouldn't, you know, shouldn't we take that into account? And then I've learned way more than I ever thought I would about Somali farming methods and flood irrigation and how the whole village gets together and works continuously for like 48 hours, spreading water on each of the fields in the dry season. And, and yes, there actually there's a lot of people out there. And, um, and yes, Al-Shabaab was fighting that night, but not, in, not here. They were somewhere else. And once you start to get all those details, you feel like you have a fuller picture from a variety of people that um, I, I would say, are these people Al-Shabaab or not, is the hardest question. And you don't answer it on any one question. It's a, like a mosaic uh, from lots of little pieces of data. It, makes, it goes back to the answer that, that Sarah um, gave about sources of information. You know, where are you getting the information that is allowing you to make these targeting decisions? And if you're looking for sort of patterns of life, and you had really seen that, okay, for 48 hours, you're going to have a rotation of people sleeping in that field right. because they're dropping the water, right? But if you're just coming in and you say, ooh, suspicious, why are there three men in a field at night? And you haven't sort of done the background um, and gotten that information. No, this is very common for this time of year in this community for these people. Right. You know, you're going to make, um, and you don't have civilian protection sort of at the forefront of your tactic tactical decisions, you will make decisions about targeting that you might not have made if you were thinking about civilian protection and, and getting all of the information sooner than later. So that was a good question. Um, I think I told Jeff I would call on him. And then I will call on the gentleman. In fact, we'll just keep the mic right here in this row so that we can be efficient in our time. Hi, Jeff Emerson with the Arms Control Association, the Forum on the Arms Trade. Um, a small point is I think what's always frustrating about these conversations is we have to recognize that as Americans we don't value the lives of people who aren't Americans and that's what enables us to fight wars these way. Um, but my question sort of relates to the others and whether I'm really intrigued by this German example which I didn't realize about the German base saying hey are you using these weapons legitimately. So there's sort of three related other questions. One is you know, another scary thing about this policy is essentially we're allowed to kill people in other countries. And obviously, if other countries were doing that in the United States, we'd never allow that. But are we seeing other countries sort of adopting the same approach to warfare as the US is by doing this? And I'm thinking possibly of Russia and Syria. Um, but are we seeing you know, this sort of rights degradation and war fighting degradation now being taken on by others? Yemen and Saudi Arabia might be a, another example. 
secondly, you know, our, one of the examples you mentioned is the Afghanis started to say, uh, be engaged in the U.S. policy in 2009, 2010. Are there places where the national governments, although weak, are trying to restrain U.S. behavior in how they're conducting the war fighting scene? We want to liberate the town. We don't want to destroy it. You know, is that mentality being mentioned in other countries? And then our third, are there other examples like Germany where there's actually pushback, um, maybe not by the belligerents themselves, but by others that are helping with it um, to uh, change U.S. behavior? Why don't you hand the mic here, and we'll just take all these questions. Uh, Solly Booker with the Center for International Policy. I wanted to thank all the panelists as well individually for your work, but also for the organizations you represent, um, which are so critical to, to bringing this discussion to bear, and to the Stimson Center in particular. And the report you did a, a while ago also about proposing a drone policy uh, for the United States, which I would recommend to everyone. You should promote it, <laughs> right? Yes. There's not enough discussion of it. Um, but I, I wanted to ask each of the panelists to drill a little deeper on this question of legal authority. By what legal authority is the U.S. doing what it's doing? You know, the government has an obligation to produce a report on the legal and policy frameworks for guiding U.S. military uh, use of force, you know, and it's supposed to be updated every six months, et cetera. So it does articulate what it believes it's doing in Somalia and other six countries where we're at war. Um, and also, if, if folks could comment a bit on this other legal question, which is, you know, the U.S. Air Force is building a drone base in Agadez, in Niger. It's the largest single <coughs> construction project the American Air Force has ever undertaken anywhere in the world. It's over $120 million. It's over budget. It's over time frame. It's supposed to be launched this year. And it's probably unconstitutional in Niger, and there's a real question as to legally who will own <coughs> that drone base. And it's significant because this will be an armed Reaper drone base, and that's uh, why the U.S. is investing so much in it. Um, and then I also want the, the panelists to comment on this, the issue of credibility. Um, uh, do you, particularly in journalism, uh, what credibility does AFRICOM and the CIA and DOD have when reporting on civilian casualties? Uh, it goes to this question of verification, what their methodologies are, et cetera. Uh, but then when we get to the American public, I would say, you know, in addition to what people have, have said already, there is a racial divide. Uh, we're talking about killing black and brown people. We're talking about killing Muslims. We're talking about extrajudicial killings, assassination programs, murder. We can call it, we can sanitize it and call it airstrikes or other things like that. But this is extrajudicial murder of individual people in Africa and the Middle East, largely. And so that divide exists in the public as well here. For people of African descent in this country, this is the equivalent of uh, extrajudicial killings here in the United States. It's the equivalent of racial profiling in the United States. It's the equivalent of what we see every day when we turn on the news and we see unarmed black youths or older people being killed by police or other agents of the U.S. government. Um, and it's not new, you know, it's not, it, it's not even, it wasn't even new when Black Panther uh, militants were killed in Chicago under an assassination campaign where the police literally took intelligence from the FBI, went in and killed Fred Hampton. It's the same type of operation. And so there is a failure to address this other elephant in the room, which is the, the, the fundamentals of racism in U.S. foreign policy in the national security paradigm. And it becomes all the more relevant now because of the current occupant in the White House, who's very much an apologist for, uh, as you know, witness in his reaction to the New Zealand killings, his unwillingness to identify and call out uh, white supremacism, violent white supremacism, as a rising international threat, let alone the historic threat it's always been in this country. So I know that's a lot, but I just. Um, 
you know, the panel has been so good, I wanted to share all that. <laughs> so I got eight questions out of our last two panel, uh, last two. I, I get it. I, I was moving up the room. So I think given that we have four minutes um, left in the event, I think you all, you both raised some really crucial issues and I was, I took notes of them because I think there are several events <laughs> that we could think about within all of those questions. But I want to give um, our panelists the opportunity to sort of pick and choose, sort of as their final comments, something from those questions um, to address. And I'm looking at Sarah, because she's nodding, that she might be ready. Um, Let's let Sarah go so first. I'm going to let Sarah go first to give Missy and Brian some time. I'm not going to pick and choose. I'm going to answer every single <laughs> one of them. Um, no, I w I'm, I'm going to. Um, what was the one I wanted? <laughs> uh, now I can't remember. It was it was one of them that you had asked. The first one that you had asked about legal authority or legal Niger authority. drone base. Ah, but, here's yeah. what I wanted to say. So yes, the U.S. military has to put forward. Here is our plan for counterterrorism in whatever place. And when you read through that plan, it makes such innate sense. Like yes, of course we have to do this and we have to do that and that. What I would really like to see is an appendix to that that says, and here's the impact we think our operations are going to have on the civilian population, on the government of that place where we are going, on international credibility and legitimacy. Pick whatever factors you want. There are like 15 of them. But actually have to think through what the blowback or ramifications are. And if they're all good, fantastic, but I sincerely doubt it. I just, maybe I'll try to get one um, of each of your questions. Uh, and just on the legal authority, I would just say that, you know, the U.S. military is operating in all of these countries that we're talking about under the 2001 AUMF. Um, and in my opinion, Congress has really abdicated its responsibility to exercise oversight of the way that is happening. Um, and on the, uh, uh, the question I wanted to address that you all made really excellent points um, on credibility. Does the military have credibility? I mean, I think that's really in the eye of the beholder. I, I, as a journalist, think it's very problematic that we don't know a lot about their methodology, the amount of resources that they're directing to trying to reconcile this huge gap in the internal and external estimates of how many people have died. Um, so I do think that there is a real credibility problem, but I want to also give them credit for doing better than a lot of um, other advanced militaries um, uh, on that count. And then on the question of are we setting the wrong precedent, I think that that is, um, you know, the United States um, has a lot of responsibility because of its, uh, the scale and the power and the, and the role that we play. Um, but I do think that if you look at the history of war, it's a history of civilian suffering or collateral damage or whatever you want to say. I don't think the United States um, uh, invented this or was the worst in history. I would say that you know Russia in Syria is way worse. As far as I understand it, they use dumb bombs. I think that you're talking about um, uh, what appears to be intentional targeting of civilian population centers. Um, so I would imagine that the death toll there is much, much higher. Brian. Let me see if I can remember to get through a couple of these. So credibility. Um, I would say that uh, 110 airstrikes and 800 dead terrorists and zero civilian casualties is not a credible statement. And I just don't know how anybody that works on the issue, including in the U.S. military, can like say that with a straight face. It just, it, like people that have, if you've been in combat, there's just no way that that is possible. And these are you know, veterans of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that are writing to Congress and saying it's zero. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So Al-Shabaab propaganda is real, and I, uh, there's lots of Al-Shabaab propaganda online, and it's hard not to look at, like, the DOD telling Congress that they have a perfect record is also propaganda in some way. It just doesn't make sense. Um, on the uh, question of countries and supporting the U.S. and what are their obligations and the, the whole Germany thing, I think it's kind of interesting because there are, just like uh, Missy was talking about, the U.S., like whether they lend moral credibility to the Saudis by helping out, I think there's a number of European countries that are asking that question about the United States. And in fact, my colleague Ella Knight's here. She was one of the writers on a report last summer about uh, European support to U.S. drone operations. 
and basically, um, hey, Spain, Italy, Germany, Holland, uh, are you cool with all this? Is the basic is the basic question of that, and I think it's a um, it's a worthwhile question. What was? Oh, there was one more. Yeah, I, I hate to. I hate to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I hate to to end on not being on having a loose thought, but I guess that's where we that's where we might end up. Well, I have a lot of thoughts. I do not have time to make those thoughts. I know it's no surprise to all of you that I have a lot of thoughts about this. But I do, and I was trying to. I was trying to turn this into some sort of positive. So my positive is going to be to thank our um, excellent panelists who clearly we did not give enough time to this event because I think we had you know really fascinating discussions. So I thank all of you for giving so much of not only your time today but to these issues and for bringing them and continuing to bring them to the forefront so that we can have, I hope, a very credible conversation um, about the issues even if we don't have credible answers uh, to provide. I, I, and I and thanks to all of you for your very excellent questions and to the live streamers for watching and also asking questions and we will do it again because it worked. Um, but I do, you know, I was, I was trying to think of, you know, some brilliant thing to sum this all up. And I, I guess I'm worried is, is where it comes down to that, you know, we've had events here at the Stimson Center on civilian casualties and U.S. airstrikes before. And it's not just that it's Groundhog Day every day, but I actually think we're worse off today than we were two years ago when we had this event, and certainly three and four and five years ago when we started talking about these issues in earnest um, here at the center. And the irony that three and four and five years ago when I was saying this isn't good enough, um, I am now nostalgic for me saying it wasn't good enough then really causes me great concern. And I think it is um, really important that we don't just continue this conversation amongst the sort of policy elite and those who are activists working in, this organiz uh, in these organizations and bringing it to the Hill and bringing it to policymakers. But I think changing the discourse in this country, as has been mentioned um, throughout, is really important. And that we do have to have these difficult questions at our dinner tables and with our families outside of this so that people do care, whether it is the racial injustice that we are seeing and sort of the lack of caring for people in other countries, but really getting outside of ourselves and really feeling what, you know, um, 19 years of or 18 years of war looks like and how that affects us as a nation and our perceptions of our involvement um, in foreign policy and military operations around the world. That's a hard conversation, but it's certainly a conversation that we can't let another generation go without having an honest assessment of. So thank you. We will have more of those conversations here on this stage, and I hope with all of you. But thank you for giving so much of your time today, and thanks to, to all of you.